President Macron has convened us for what has been dubbed as the How Dare You Summit. And for sure, I think we have confronted financial orthodoxy. We have confronted shareholder power, global capitalism, and corporate power. And we have also had a conversation about big oil. Madam Lawrence, to be honest, spoke about breaking taboos. Prime Minister Mia Motley reminded us that this is not a formal decision-making forum but a pivotal moment to set aside our national interest and end the perpetual blame game. I want to repeat here again, as I did before, this is not about North versus South. It is not about uh, emitters or non-emitters. It's not about the rich versus poor, climate guilty or innocent, and the powerful or the powerless. It's about all of us, big and small. It's about us in our diversity. And it's about crafting a win-win outcome. These are the benchmarks we have established for ourselves. They will serve us as a criteria against which we must assess our agreement. We have agreed that no country should be forced to choose between eradicating poverty and preserving the climate. We have agreed on some additional resources to support the vulnerable, and the poorer countries. We have advanced discussion on reforming the governance of the multilateral development banks. We have progressed the conversation on a new global source for financing uh, for climate and the mechanisms that can be put together to insulate us from national interest and global power structure whose decision-making processes include all of us are not just a few shareholders. We are agreeing that for the first time, as we leave Paris, um, President Macron, and you have been incredible. You have run this like Kenyans should do. You have run it like a marathon. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this was not a, a session to coerce anybody to do anything different from, it was, it was a meeting of minds to try and bring consensus the same way we managed to forge a consensus in 2015 is to try and eliminate the tensions that have informed the journey to where we are today and to see whether we can recreate the consensus that had been built um, in mobilizing the world towards dealing with the challenge of climate change and international financing architecture. Um, this was not uh, a session to discuss, although all of us are signatories to the UN Charter that respects independence of countries, uh, boundaries of countries. We are all believers in that, and that is why my colleagues from the African continent went to Kiev, went to St. Petersburg, because we believe there can be a peaceful resolution of all conflicts, including those in our continent, in Sudan, in DRC, in Somalia, there is always a way that we can resolve this in a peaceful manner. Our concern, uh, at least those of us from the uh, global south and especially in Africa, is the effects the war is having on commodity prices, fertilizer, grain. That, that's really impacting very negatively on the cost of living. It's also raising concerns to us because, because of the challenge of energy. Uh, Russia having done whatever they did, many countries are going back to fossil fuel. You know, uh, the examples are out there. Uh, we are getting reports that maybe the UK is going to switch on their coal plants. I think that's not good for what we are trying to deal with. It's not good for the challenge we are, we are faced with, the existential threat that faces humanity. The moment we do engage the reverse gear about the things that we had done and uh, we thought we were making progress, it concerns not just us, but I'm sure it concerns humanity. The ultimate judgment of our success does not rest in our arms. In the coming days, the world will pass the verdict on us. 
But I must say, having part, been part of this conference, we have made tremendous progress. I would have preferred to see a firm commitment built or building on the G20 debt suspension initiative to deploy a portion of the new development finance sought to provide greater fiscal space for heavily indebted countries by refinancing their maturing debts on more favorable and extended terms. Many of our countries lack the necessary fiscal room to take on additional debt. And we are saying this, it, as we discuss this new uh, financing system, we value the incredible support by the multilateral development institutions, World Bank and IMF. We also have a wonderful relationship with China. They finance our infrastructure development. The tension between the West and China is unhelpful, is unnecessary, and is as useless as the tension between the North and South when we discuss climate change. That is not necessary. We must find the formula that will bring all our financing to respond to three issues, urgency, scale, and to make it much more affordable. That is the conversation that we want to have. And hopefully, we have laid the seeds of that conversation to happen. Again, thank you, President Macron, for making it possible for China to sit here and for the West to sit here, and those of us from the African continent to be in the equation. We don't take it for granted. Let me mention three straight things. Number one, we are bringing our ideas. We've had a very honest but candid conversation around the table. We've had others, but we've, they've also listened to us because we believe that uh, we do not want anymore to be a continent where people complain, where we are victims, where we are the corner. We, we believe that Africa can step forward in a very proud way to work with the rest of the world on the challenges we have and provide solutions. We agree, for example, with the suggestions that it could be difficult, maybe nations, maybe when we talk about national interest, how do you uh, enforce carbon tax? How do you en enforce shipping tax? How do you deal with financial transaction tax? I mean, they are legitimate concerns. But I dare say, those who met in that little room in Bretton Wood had as difficult choices to make as we have today. But they didn't walk away from it. They forged a consensus. I think in the world we live in today, there is a lot more creativity. There is a lot more innovation. Technology can give us the opportunity to levy this tax, raise the resources, and be able to give as many, including the third issue I want to say, what Africa is bringing. We are the continent with the largest renewable energy reserves, whether it is wind, solar, geothermal, hydro. How are we going to raise the resources to unlock the huge potential in our continent? It is by having this kind of candid conversation. It is by bringing our ideas on how we can be creative, how we can be innovative, how we can leverage on technology so that we can raise the requisite resources to unlock the Hinga Dam that is giving us uh, nightmares, which can provide electricity to 15 countries. We still have 600 million Africans who do not have access to electricity, 900 of them without access, 900 million of them without access to clean cooking uh, energy. We need the scale of the resources that we are discussing and the, to democratize the raising of those resources so that it becomes a lot more easier to make decisions going into the future. 
So finally, let me say, Africa is coming with ideas. We are coming with our resources. We have the largest um, renewable energy resources. Two thirds of the world's arable, um, uh, uncultivated arable land is in our continent. We have the youngest population in the continent. These are assets that Africa is coming to the table with so that we can provide an outcome that is win-win contributed by everybody. We have agreed that we have to rethink. We are in a new normal. The new normal that came through the pandemic into the Ukraine-Russia war into the vagaries and what climate change is doing to us. Floods, cyclones, uh, droughts, and, and, and the, the threat to humanity that we see. This new normal requires a new approach. We're all clear that up to 52 countries are facing debt uh, distress. I listened to my sister, Kristalina, and you know, Kristalina, we have a wonderful relationship. You have been immensely supportive of Kenya. But looking at this context and listening to the discussion about the SDR, the allocation, the reallocation, the application, the verification, the assessment, the next, I get a headache. <laughs> Honestly, I sincerely think that there is a much more creative way of dealing with this. The same way we did it during COVID. There is a way we can do this so that those in distress, the 52 countries to start with, how do we make it possible for them? Since they are already assessed for the debts they owe, how do we make them? enjoy the benefit of a pause or reschedule or um, whatever you want to call it, so that they can have immediate liquidity and create space for themselves. That is a conversation that I think uh, we should have. And let me say, this will move us closer to addressing the crisis that we have today on matters liquidity. We have also had a conversation and progressed one on a new global sources of financing for climate action and mechanisms that can be better insulated from national interest. This will move us close to addressing the climate crisis as a global common good, as opposed to something that we have to play a balancing act with the national interest on one end and do this uh, at scale. So they can do this at scale, agency, and which our as if our existence depend on it. Let me, let me clarify. Um, Emmanuel, you've been immensely, I mean, speaking to you as a member of the G7, you have been immensely accommodative of the, all the divergent views that have come on the floor and in all the fora that we have enjoyed ourselves in, here. We are saying we want this time around a mechanism that involves everybody, where nobody, where we are all paying, where we are all involved, and where we all decide. Because climate change is not about the North or the South. It's about all of us. And the discussion about carbon tax is a discussion that is a must have. And on this one, we do not want the North to pay for the South. We want all of us to pay, whether it is aviation tax, whether it is uh, fuel tax, whether it is shipping tax, we want to pay because we want to be on the table. The conversation about who has not paid what is very energy sapping. It is very tiring. We want to have a different conversation. And I am very happy that that conversation has begun in Paris, and thank you, President Macron, for making it possible for this conversation to happen. We have some time between now and the Africa Climate Summit 
in Nairobi on the, between the 4th and the 6th of September. That is co-hosted by the Africa Union, and I was told by the chairman of the Africa Union who was here with us, the Africa Union Commission, to invite none other than President Macron. You will be a keynote speaker. We want you to carry the gains we have made here to Nairobi, onward to UN General Assembly, and finally to COP28. The progress that has been made here is immense. Let me uh, tell you, uh, President Macron, I know you said yourself that there is some work to be done. Yes, there is some work to be done. But we have plenty of time between now and Nairobi. We have like three months. As I told you yesterday, um, the UN Charter was negotiated in two months. I also said that the Bretton Woods Institution where Kristalina and Ajay are working, they were negotiated in a little village, a little town called Bretton Wood in 1945. In three weeks, we have a lot of time between here and uh, Nairobi, and between Nairobi and COP28, we can fix this and it can happen for all of us. Thank you very much. On taxation, I am in favor of an international tax financing the efforts we will be called upon to make to fight against poverty and for the climate. I have reminded you that France has applied two taxes which were early, earlier proposed on airplane tickets on the one hand and financial transactions on the other. But you will agree that an international tax is an international tax when everyone has adopted it. And as we saw with socialism, international taxes do not work in one single country. And we are finding ourselves at a technological frontier. We cannot go on hurting ourselves all alone in our corner. We are going to have to try to oblige others to follow us and to be all mobilized. We are in favor of an international tax on maritime transport because it's a sector which hasn't been taxed, and there's no reason that it shouldn't be taxed. There's no reason it should not contribute to all the efforts that are being made all around the planet. I think that's an excellent cause. We need to go on mobilizing people. We have a club of people who are like-minded, and I think that it's not the only area in which you're going to have to negotiate, but we will negotiate there, and we will begin with probably a very modest contribution because it's a sector which is decarbonizing and we're supporting them to that end. But it's also entirely justified that the very high, sometimes, income streams which are made there be taxed. But for that, in order to work, we have to do the same thing that we've done with international taxation, minimal international taxation, which is that we need to have a series of countries that are following the lead. And to be very clear, if China, the United States, and some key European countries that also have large firms involved don't follow, then you'll set up a tax, but nothing will happen because the people who you tax will go toward countries where you don't pay the tax. And so obviously key countries in this area have to be brought on board and we're going to go on working along those lines. And our next meeting at the IMO in July will be of decisive importance. And you've understood these aren't just words. These are concrete answers. This is a follow-up mechanism and at the very latest, in two years, we'll meet again, but there will certainly be some intermediate meetings and some in-depth changes. This mechanism is meant here as well to include on a very broad base, as President Russell reminded us, this is our goal, not just with our governments, but with our civil populations. Two comments by way of conclusion and some thanks. One comment, I think the strength of this summit was to bring together here a bit more than 40 heads of state and government, G7 member countries, major emerging countries, poorest countries, countries recently impacted by climate change, and who have an experience of vulnerability coming from all parts of the world. Our discussion was very free. In our plenary session today at our dinner yesterday, where people were called on for certain things, were criticized, but I think that's a necessary precondition to build this clear, lucid, serious structure. I think this its method means that our summit was called upon to bring about unity in the international community in terms of the answer we bring to our twin problems, the fight against inequality and the fight for the planet. If we fail, we will certainly head toward a fragmentation of our international institutions. Those that exist have been progressively made 
less legitimate by the poorest, and the people have money and ideas need to be able to contribute to it in a very different way, and that will come. I think our responsibility is to uphold this unity in the service of the common good and of our principles, which we have redefined here. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who made the summit possible, obviously the heads of state and government, the Secretary General, my personal representative, their teams, the team from the Elysee, which were all on board, the ministers who have been here, their closest teams, their national administrations, whether we're talking about the Quai d'Orsay or Bercy in France, the foreign ministry and the finance ministry, which contributes to the discussion of all these texts, and then the French Development Agency and many other structures. I would also like to thank the Paris Peace Forum and its team, which also were of great assistance, and all the NGOs and representatives of civil society who were involved. We made a commitment, and it was held that 50 percent of the delegations and of the invited delegates coming from all continents, but would also come from civil society. And I want to thank all the NGOs who made that possible, who were mobilized, the representatives of civil society, and especially of youth, who we heard from yesterday in the opening session particularly, and who had a lot of feedback into the platform of the summit, our site, and everything that was set up by our Secretary General and they will go on working with us over time in the follow-up mechanisms. I won't go on at any greater length. I would simply like to answer the three questions which we will have. Thank you. I, I do share these concerns. The, it was a commitment made in Paris Agreement, and uh, the expert at the opening session of, um, of this summit told us that um, now uh, we, we were getting this uh, 100 billion uh, climate fund, but it's clear that it was too slow and we want now a, concre a concrete analysis. I mean, you know that the mechanism is a report made every year by o o OECD. So we have this report and we know uh, approximately who is contributing and not contributing and how it, it works. But now we need a much uh, structured and precise follow-up in order to make it much more perceivable and, um, and agreed. So I do share this concern and this is why in the conclusions of this summit and the, the two pages um, we will ask for a, a much uh, detailed uh, analysis and assessment process of this, uh, of this climate fund. As for the other package of 100 billion, um, I, I do report here that we delivered what we committed to do uh, two years ago. France decided to reallocate 40% of its SDRs, and uh, um, so the 100 billion is committed. 61 are already in the hands of the IMF and allowed IMF to start with the several programs as mentioned by uh, the MD, and, uh, and we will follow up on that. I did certainly hear President Lula's concerns about dependence of trade on the dollar and the desire to move away from it. And that's a sentiment we've heard from a number of countries for different reasons. Um, most importantly, um, the ability that dependence on the dollar gives the United States to levy sanctions on countries that are guilty of um, enormous abuses, including human rights abuses. But um, there's a very good reason why the dollar is used so widely um, in trade, and that's because we have deep, liquid, open capital markets, a rule of law, and um, long and deep finance, um, financial instruments that make it safe and convenient. Um, U.S. Treasuries are the world's uh, safest asset. Um, although there is some diversification of reserve assets, certainly the lion's share countries choose to hold in the dollar. It's not really easy for other countries to replicate that set of advantages, but understand that there is a motive to want to do so. The IMF plays an important role in providing policy advice and technical assistance along with critical financing. We've had constructive discussions about ensuring that the IMF 
can continue to provide concessional lending now and in the longer term. And we call on the IMF to present all available options to put its poverty reduction and growth facility on a sustainable footing in the near term by the annual meetings. And we also call for a broad range of donors to meet the IMF's uh, financing targets for the trust. Now, we also need to complete outstanding debt cases. Debt is a global challenge and it requires urgent cooperation from all creditors. To that end, I'm pleased that all official bilateral creditors have reached consensus to move forward with the debt treatment for Zambia under the leadership of the Chinese and French co-chairs. And I just saw Premier Li at the high-level panel and I'm encouraged that China is moving to help address the debt challenges facing developing countries. Beyond resolving outstanding cases, a productive first step to provide greater certainty and timeliness to the debt process would be the publication of a guide to the common framework for borrowers. Third concerns private capital mobilization. As we announced earlier this morning, the Investor Leadership Network, which includes companies with a total of over $10 trillion in assets under management, has launched a new commitment to accelerate pension fund and institutional investments in emerging and developing economies over the next three years. And the United States will work closely with them to facilitate investments in the critical areas of energy transition and sustainable infrastructure. I also continue to believe that MDBs should launch a set of more innovative tools to boost private capital mobilization. And that is a priority shared by many leaders of these institutions, like President Banga. We've already taken significant complementary action. Through the G7, we seek to mobilize $600 billion for high quality infrastructure investment through the public and private funds over five years. And the United States has already achieved $30 billion of its $200 billion commitment. And through initiatives like the JetPs or Just Energy Transition Partnerships, we're bringing public and private sources of funding together to provide tens of billions of dollars to fight climate change and spur economic development in emerging economies. Well, the challenge to the world that has brought us here to Paris is to make sure that the global financial architecture can orient the necessary finance toward the essential tasks of eradicating poverty, combating climate change, and building a global economy that allows people and the planet to thrive. There's a great deal of work to do, and I look forward to working with the leaders on this stage and many more to advance our shared efforts. Thank you again, Mr. President, for your leadership. The summit is an important milestone in our effort to evolve the global financial architecture to be more responsive to the tremendous challenges and opportunities facing us. And the last two days have made me optimistic about the progress we've made so far and the momentum that I believe can carry us forward in the coming months. I'd like to touch on our progress in three areas that I focused on during my time here at the summit. First, our initiative to evolve the multilateral development banks, or MDBs. Global challenges like climate, pandemics, and fragility and conflict are putting development gains at risk. That's why I called for the evolution of the development banks last fall to tackle these global challenges with sufficient speed and scale. Our goal is to strengthen the MDB's work on eradicating poverty 
and supporting sustainable growth, their traditional goals, not distract from them. We've made significant progress on the MDB Evolution Initiative with a broad coalition of shareholders. And our coalition has made preliminary updates to the World Bank's mission and its operating model. We are unlocking as much as $50 billion in additional lending capacity over the next decade. And our estimate is that the MDBs as a whole system could unlock $200 billion in new lending capacity over the same time frame, and that's through balance sheet measures that are either already under implementation or being deliberated. Now, that by itself would be a very significant achievement. We could have $200 billion in lending capacity that we didn't have before to invest in some of the most pressing problems facing the world, combating climate change, lifting people out of poverty, preparing for future epidemics, and much more. But the evolution is not just about the balance sheet. It's about making sure we use these resources in a more impactful manner. So we're pushing for additional reforms on a rolling basis. And this includes work to optimize our climate finance architecture. We are very focused on the need to um, raise substantial additional resources to address climate change and poverty reduction um, and other global challenges. And so um, we're very open to um, innovative approaches. And hopefully, we have put some on the table ourselves. I think this is a very constructive suggestion. I think would agree with President Macron's description of the logic of why it would be appropriate, and it's something that the United States will look at.